Did you know that in Scripture, I, I want to go through this a little bit quicker, so I'm going to go over this way because i got a little bit of time. In Scripture, the King James Version, the, the tree is mentioned 328 times. That's a lot, isn't it? Man, there's so many different ways that we look at this tree, and I want us to be able to see just a few verses. I don't want to go through all of those, a good, good bit of them. <laughs> I want to go through this and just see how God lists the tree and see if you can find Christ in your tree. Because if we just look at it as the tree itself, it's beautiful because it's God's creation. But all we see is the needles, the lights, the ornaments. And of course, the star is not blinking, no lights, but you know, just let it start at the top. But, but what else matters in a tree, especially this time of the year? What does everybody, especially kids, what do they look for? What is it? What's down there? The presents, the gifts, <laughs> right? We get those from this. Everything that we get from God comes in that area. I'm going to wrap this up real quick, and then I'm going to hit this, because so, I want to go over it. It's got a lot to do. Scripture tells us that he's the bright morning star that have come down. That's why it's the stars at the top. And as it comes down, it comes down in this form of a tree, it says that he died on a tree. That tree representing the cross, which first off illuminates us. He says he is the light unto men and that let us shine. It shines through us to be able to shine to the world. With that, he gives us ornaments, his instructions, his ways in which to go, the good things, the provisions, other things to that nature. But everything from there comes down to where we get at the bottom of the tree every good and perfect gift. All wraps up into that. If we can't find out and all we hear is a ho, 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 jolly fat man, all we hear is i got to hurry up and go to that Demon Black Friday thing, you know, but, or Amazon, whatever it might be, then we miss the whole thing. Because to me, I know I can redeem that. So when I look at the tree, I don't want my kids to think ho, 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 or a red-nosed reindeer, or some magical this or magical that. I want them to see Christ in all that we have. So as my grandkids look at a tree, it's not about, I want to go take a picture of Santa Claus. It's, guess, what's got, guess what came to me through that? It's Jesus. He came down on the tree, the cross, to die for me so that I could have these gifts at the bottom. That's good, isn't it? I thought everything we do in word and deed is supposed to be done unto the Father, given thanks through Jesus Christ, what word says. Right? At least that's what it says. So it takes us now to this tree. So let's, let's go through this. I want to see just a little bit of this. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, we get this example so we can see how God uses a tree. God plants trees, and the biggest one being the tree of life. For the Lord God planted the garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed a man whom he had formed out of the ground. And the Lord God caused the, to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Notice that this tree, these other trees where there was a bunch of them, but the other trees there were good. They were pleasing to the sight and good for food. So not every, anybody ever go up through the mountains and see the colors? Pretty cool, right? I hear a lot of people love to travel that and all that. I'm just so used to seeing them all from being up in the mountains areas in Pennsylvania that I'm not like that guy go, oh, look how beautiful. Because I'm thinking, oh, i got to pick them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, it, to me, it, it, it's still nice. But then the trees that we can eat off of, both are beneficial for us. Both. But he goes to tell us some of these. I think that we need to keep this in mind. But he goes on. Then God uses the in the Old Testament to symbolize the Messiah, to symbolize Jesus. Look at what he says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. Then a shoot will spring forth, a stem of Jesse, and a branch from the roots he will bear fruit. Then Isaiah 4, verse 2. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be, will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth will be the pride and the adornment of the survivors of Israel. Whoa. Then some say, as we go, with it, that it came from that, that Jesus was put into a cradle. Anybody heard that? The manger, the cradle, right? Watch this here in Luke chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for the inn. 
But as custom truthfully has it, it is we see this was really done out of rock. That the manger, the cradle, was not out of wood, but it was honed out of rock. And it really goes full circle for us. And I want you, I know some of you are looking at me like, what? Really goes full circle. Watch this. I love how it goes. And take you to Mark chapter 15, verse 46. I can relate to this because this is the place of his birth, and this was the place that he was put upon when he was rested by Joseph Arimatha. Joseph brought a linen cloth and took him down and wrapped him in the linen cloth and laid him in the tomb, which he had honed out of rock, and he rolled a stone against it to the entrance of the tomb. Hmm. So we go full circle. Jesus is all about full circles. Did you know that? Did you know what he started with we're going to end with? We're going to end back in his life again. We're going to end back where we're basking with him, his family, forever and ever and ever. So we're going back to Eden. Isn't that cool? Paradise. Yeah, I don't know about you. Y'all might be shooting for something else, but I'm shooting for paradise, man. I want to be in heaven in the presence of the Lord because I know everything that I got right here are temporary. All my accolades, all my goals, my medals, my trophies, they all fall to the ground. All my doctorates, certifications, degrees, and, and bachelors, they're all going to just be burnt up. All my, my, my doctrinal tags are going to fall. And all my knowledge that I know is going to cease. All my tongues are going to stop. Why? Because I want to be in the presence of the Almighty of the Almighty. Man, that is good, isn't it? Yeah, see, I like that. This sort of goes with me. But in this, we find full circle. We find that Jesus came down and he settled in a stone. He wore a rock. He turned around and they, when he died, he went out on a rock. And you know why? It's because he is the rock. Isn't that good? So he says, upon this rock... I'll build my church. The gates of hell cannot. <laughs> so we got to get this pretty cool, right? At least I think so. Then the baby on the cradle, thank you, dear. The baby on the cradle became the man on the cross. We find this again in John chapter 19, verse 17 to 18. They took Jesus down, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. They crucified him there, and with him, two other men on both sides. On this cross, everything in life just hinges. All of the timelines, all history, all of humanity, all of everything was there. I want to back up just to go with this, just, just a bit. I've got a little bit, of, little bit of time here. God, before he created the earth, he thought of you. So here's what I want you to do. As soon as I say he thought of, I want you to shout your name. Not, I want you to shout your name. Could you do that? Listen, I know we're really small this morning, but that's okay. Let's do that. Ready? So God in all creation, he thought of. And he knew that was going to be a mess up. He knew that you were going to be subject to sin, sickness, and death. He knew that every time that you would stand up to try to make a step, you would get knocked back down by the evil of evils. But he said, I have a solution. He was speaking out loud, and his son Jesus said, let me go. Because he knew there had to be a sacrifice. Something had to be done that would change time. Let's say reverse the curse. So this is where Jesus came upon the cross, and he took you. And all of your ugly, sinful, nasty, fleshly self. And he nailed it to the cross with him. That you may have life. And have life abundantly. To me, that's pretty powerful. There's not one thing. Do you realize there's not one demon in hell that can skip between you and the glory of God? Did you realize there's not one sickness. There's not one sin. There's not one thing that can get between you and the Spirit of God that lives within you? There is something so powerful that gets rid of all of that. It comes from the blood of the little baby found in the manger. Lived his life being tempted like we, without sin, who died on the cross, went into the grave, went to hell, took every key, came back to set us free. That's good. So when we look at the tree, let's not look at, oh, I got to go buy this, I got to go buy that, I got to go buy this. I gotta. Let's look at that, by that tree, it bought my salvation. That tree 
bought my freedom, bought my healing, brought my deliverance. It bought everything I need, everything, by that tree. That's pretty good, isn't it? Jesus does this for us to set us free. It's really awesome. So then we find in this, in this part of this tree, we find this, that he was cursed. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become the curse for us. For as is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on that tree. Whoa. Then we find that all of our sins, all of our sicknesses were put on that cross to set us free again. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. On the cross. So that what? We might die to sin. Somebody say, I want to die to sin. That I might stand in living with him. Not, not, not fall in living, but stand in living. A sinless life through his. Now I'm not saying that you're not going to go through sins and stuff. I mean, that's part of that sanctification. We're still living in this world. But we could stand in front of him, knowing that we are sinless in the eyes of God through the blood of what he's done. Isn't that good? Really, to me, that just makes me go, thank you, Jesus, for everything I need. But then he goes on. For by his wounds, I am, I am, I am, I am. What sickness in our life? It's not just a fleshly sickness. It's not just a mental sickness. It could be a relationship sickness. It could be a fine. I'm telling you, there's everything we need comes from the cross. Now, this isn't a a prosperity message that's taught on TV, but this is the prosperity message that's taught by Jesus himself. I taught one of the, the most powerful disciples, apostles that he's ever had, Peter, speaks this for us to know that God provides everything we need. Amen? So let me ask you this as we get ready to go on to the lights. People wear crosses all over the place, don't they? They wear them around their neck. They get them tattooed. They, they got them hanging on their walls, right? They got them hanging from their mirrors. And there's nothing wrong with that. So why can't we have a tree to represent the same thing. Because can I tell you this? The ark, the cross, and what some people want to say, the cradle, they all came from there. But I know one other thing that did too. The rod, the rod of Aaron. The rod. I'm not talking about Moses' rod. Moses' rod represents the cross. The rod of Aaron represents your power in this life today. For what seems dead, he will produce life in as he made it blossom. Those clusters, those clusters of almonds. Isn't that good? All this we get from a tree. All that. To me, that's pretty good. So let's move on to the lights. So we can see that there's quite a few different symbols with this, but we're only going to cover a few. And first off, God calls himself the light of the world, but he calls us, us the light of the world. Let's hit that one first. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 to 16. If you are a salt of the earth, let the salts become tasteless. How, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. One day we're going to cover that verse a little bit deeper. And I pray that you get your heart with that and you can see how it really rolls. But then he goes on. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill. It cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who enter the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So a question, what kind of light are you? Are you one of those lights that's troublesome? Anybody ever had a, a light that's troublesome on their tree? Anybody ever go up and it's like, man, you just put all your lights in and then, then all of a sudden, see if I can, I better know I'm going to break it. Anyway, let me just go this because I might break it and then Kim will kill me. And you have to do a funeral. Anybody have a, well, you got your tree, it's looking really good, you got the light shaped out just right and, and all the other stuff and all of a sudden the next day it's it went out. So you're trying to find which one went out. Anybody ever do that? Some of us, that's our light. We're a trouble light. All we do is flicker a little bit, just enough to make everything else off key. See, if we submit to the cross, to the, what the Lord has done, he will shine through us to be the light unto men. So we've got to ask the question, what kind of light are we? It goes on Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Man, that is pretty cool, right? Now watch this. 
Do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of these things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light. For everything that has become visible in the light, for this reason it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So what light are you putting out? How are you getting there? This is the tree. These are the things that should remind us. The purity of the lights that's there. Then it goes on to God is the light. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Hence what kind of light you're shining. If you're walking in God, you're going to see light. The fruit of, the fruit of walking in the light is you bearing light. The fruit of walking right, living a good life, living a changed life, is your life being good and the fruits behind you of righteousness that's following you. Not righteousness of our own, but righteousness of God. It changes us. But then he goes on how to do this. This is how it shines, through God. And the next is his word. Find this again in Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my paths. Yeah. Then he goes on to talk to us the next step here about ornaments. These are godly ways. It's all those fine ornaments that's up there. And I know we're missing a few because we're waiting for some people to bring some in. But all of those represent something. They all represent something for us to walk in. Look at what Proverbs says. The instructions of the Father. Hear, my son, your father's instructions. And do not forsake your mother's teachings. For indeed, they are a graceful wreath around your head and ornaments about your neck. Then God goes on to tell us about the provisions that he gives us. Again, we find this in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 17 to 14. But I want to touch just a few here. And it starts out with, I made you numerous like plants of the field. Then you grew up and became tall and reached the age of fine ornaments. I want to jump down to verse 11 real quick. And as it says, I adorned you with ornaments. Put bracelets on your hands and a necklace about your neck. I also put a ring in your nostrils and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown on your head, which now leads us to the next part of these, the crowns that we get through the Lord. He tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25, I'm going to read you the NIV version. He says this is an incorruptible crown. Everyone who competes in the games does so. And to in, everyone who competes in games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that it will not last. But we, we do it to get a crown that is incorruptible, that is everlasting. Well, in these crowns, we also find the crown of joy that we get in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, that we find in righteousness in, in 2 Timothy chapter 5. And then we go on to life in James chapter 1 and the glory in 1 Peter chapter 5. These are crowns that represent these, that, that get us to the point. But I want to hone us into it because we're getting here, to my, getting to some running out of time, to our final things I really want to touch before the, the star, and that's the gifts. So we can all find each and every one of these gifts in Romans chapter 5. I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute. What about the gifts we get from the Holy Spirit in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? That's there, but let's get these first before we can get those. So I just want to concentrate on these real quick. So if you can, turn with me if you have your Bibles to, to, to uh, Romans chapter 5. We can find so many different gifts in here, but I just want to touch a few just to get us here. The first one we find in verse 1 is justification. It's one of my favorite words. Say that with me, justification. One more time. Yeah. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, that word justified, we're going to finish this passage here. That word justified means, just put it this way, just as if I'd never sinned. Can I touch another thing? That word justified in this means just as if I died and he lives in me. Emmanuel, in man you dwell. It's pretty good, right? All this comes from what we get through a tree. That's really awesome if you ask me. I like it. This is the divine pronouncement of what of God that we are acquitted from the sin's penalty out of God's wrath and brought into the glorious light. 
It's really powerful if you ask me. The second one we get is peace. We find this in verse 1 again. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace. Somebody say peace. With God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with, uh, with God only through the cross of Christ. And let me give you this word peace when you break it out as shalom. The whole meaning for this, to put it in a word picture, is the destruction of wickedness. So that means everything is calm. Think about it. When there's no peace, it's because there's wickedness or something happening in our life, right? But that word means it gets rid of wickedness, and Jesus did that for you. Some of us aren't still walking in it because we're seeing junk in our life. We're still letting wickedness rise up when God wants us to walk in peace. I like that, I do. Then we go on to verse 2. The next thing that we have, which is our third gift, is access to God. Through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace. Yeah, this is the right to come boldly to the throne of God without condemnation or guilt, without worrying about, man, I had just messed up so bad, I turned around, God would never take me back. Do you know how many times that's happened? Look at Peter. Well, Peter, yeah, but yeah, he was just different. Well, how was he different? He was flesh and blood. Same thing. He got to the point where he cursed God, cursed him. And yet, God brought him back to making one of the, the major points, a major apostle, super apostle is the way they put it, but major apostle of our faith. So we could boldly come to him, no matter what we've done, to know that we could get everything that we need. We have access to God. Do you get that? Emmanuel, Emmanuel. You find it there? That's pagan. Really? Redeem that thing. Because I find this is before the cross was even done. It came out of a tree. I find that there. Come on. It's, it's really good. It's really good, at least for me. All right. The next thing that we find for is standing in his grace. Verse 2 again. Therefore, we come there through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in this hope of the glory of God. The whole Christian life is a result of God's grace in our lives, which we stand. We don't deserve this, but God gives it to us. It's an ingredient of all kind of things. This is a part of, of where we can have mercy that will triumph over judgment. We get this because we can stand in faith. God, I know that everything I need comes from you. God, I know that you foreknew me, and because you foreknew me, you predestined me. You have predestined my path that you would call me. You had called me to justify me. You justified me so that I could turn around and be glorified in who you are in me now. Because I am brought up by a holy calling. That's pretty powerful. We got, we got these lives that are so unsure. What's going to happen here? How this is going to work? Can I tell you, it doesn't matter the way that it plays out here. It doesn't. But what matters is how it's going to play out later. And if you walk according to this, you keep your mind right. You keep yourself attuned to the word of God and into prayer, having an intimacy with the Lord. You will fulfill the things he's called you to fulfill. Every good and perfect gift will now come to you. It won't if you're out there doing all the jiggy-jiggy with everybody else. It's not right. Rubbing up against the world and the demonic, taking the word away, getting into the world. You can't be rubbing up against something, wanting delivered and, and forgiven from it from the same time. you got to cut that off and turn and walk away. These are the things in which God's got for us. We need to stand up and walk those things. We have the power through this cross. He gives it to us. I like that. The next thing we get is one of my favorite. We find this in verses 3 and 4. It's joy in the Lord. I love joy. I just really, really do. And not only this, but with joy, let us exult in our sufferings and rejoice. Somebody say rejoice. Joy. Say it again. Joy. In our hardships, knowing that hardships, distress, pressure, trouble produces patient endurance and endurance proven character. Spiritual maturity. And proven character, hope, and confident assurance of eternal salvation. This joy of triumph in our tribulation and trouble makes us like silver and gold. We grow, we grow through each of the tribulations, not go through them. We grow through our trials. We don't just go through them. And we can have all of this through this next one, which is hope. Somebody say hope. Verse 4, hope of his glory. It endures and develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. 
See, it lets us know that for time being, we are living in a fallen world. We're going to experience tribulations and troubles, but regardless of what happens, we can joyously triumph over everything that comes against us. Yes, even our flesh. Yes, even our habitual ways. Yes, even what the devil wants to try. Because I'm telling you, when we have hope and we put our faith into Jesus, we have joy. Have you ever tried to go into a meeting or go and have somebody pray over you and they're full of their own junk? Did you know that's probably why you didn't feel like something happened to you? Because what we breathe is what we're going to start to produce. So our vibe attracts our tribe. And if there's no joy, I want to throw this this way. There ain't no Holy Ghost in it. Even did you? We so miss the power of joy that we don't understand what's truthfully there. Did you know it was a reward for Christ at the cross? He said he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Oh, well, you just, I can't find joy in this, brother. You don't know what I'm going through. I don't, but he does. And he's given you a solution through it. But you, I just don't see it. I don't. He who took everything so that you could get through everything, even death. Oh, death. Grave. Where's your victory and where's your pain? Because I know on the other sides awaits for me a heavier weight of glory. Man, is that not good? Joy. We could walk in such joy. Now, if I can sit here and preach on this for a while, and I know I don't, you don't want me to do that. So the next one we have is hope. And this is where we counter, or should we say measure, our hope. If you have joy, you'll have hope. If you have no joy, you have no hope. Some of us say, well, Pastor, I just don't have no hope. It's because you ain't got no joy. I just don't know how to get it. It's said for one of the things that we get it is from the Holy Ghost. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. We just keep on going. Maybe we need to stop and be stop drinking of the world in our own ways and start being filled with the Holy Ghost, filled with the Holy Spirit. Making our life line up to what that is. Stop for a second. Pain, I know you're there, but I'm not going to drink that in. I'm going to stand. I'm going to drink in the Holy Spirit today because this pain is just a light affliction of what my Savior's done for me. It gets us to that other side. It gets us to see good. Man, it's got to. If we don't, we're going to be miserable. And we, there, What kind of testimony is it for people to be miserable? Christians, what kind of testimony is that? That's not good, right? We're supposed to be joyous. Now, that's not always, <laughs> but it's to know, phew, man, this is good. What do you mean it's good? How can you always say, I get that all the time. Why do you always say it's, it's good or it's going to be good? Because it is. He's already worked it out for me. He who saved me has got a greater plan for me and a better end than I can have. Yeah. Yeah, what I'm going through right now in this old busted up body is no reflection of what I'm getting ready to get. Because, see, I'm walking in it now. <laughs> and I get this because of the tree. Because of, yes, I understand this wasn't Jesus' birthday. Yes, I get that, but I need you to get this. It was because of him becoming born in my life that I could celebrate his birth. That I could celebrate when he came about. I don't know about you, but every time something comes about that's good for us, we still celebrate it, don't we? We celebrate anniversaries of this or that or whatever it might be. We celebrate it. We celebrate the end of the year all the time, whether it be the end of the year, our fiscal year here or, or our culture year or even our school year. We celebrate it. Why can't we celebrate when Jesus came about for everybody? That's good. Yeah, whatever. All right. So let's go to this next one. And these, this is actually a two-part one. This is the seventh and eighth gift, really. You find this in verse 5. The love of God, as it tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We know that hope of a great future blessings will not turn out to be false because the Holy Spirit has given us lavish evidence within our hearts, that lavish evidence of God's love to know that it's there. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. By this the love of God was manifested in us, not that God sent his own son, his only begotten son, the only one of his world, the into this world to die that we might live, man, through him in this love. Not that we loved God, but yet he first loved 
He first loved and he sent his son to propitiation for our sins. That's pretty powerful stuff. To me, it's great. See, grasping God's love so that it comes, it gives us assurance and removes fear, doubt, and shame when we fall. Grasping God's love to know that we're going to see greater and bigger things only because of what he's done in us and what he's doing. That is powerful, don't you think? Somebody ought to say, yeah, buddy. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Then the last gift I just want to touch really quick is salvation from the wrath and reconciliation by his blood. Verses 9 to 11. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Yeah, buddy. It's good, isn't it? Some people don't have joy in their life because they're not walking in the reconciliation. All right, Lord. I want to touch this before I touch the star. Some of us are praying and we're not having joy in our prayers. Some of us are not having joy in our life because we're praying for something we already have and we don't even understand that we have it. Some of us are praying for breakthrough. Some of us are praying for, for healing. Some of us are praying for things, and our mind has got us so corrupt that we can't see that we can already attain that peace that passeth all understanding. We can't see to attain that we've got life and life abundantly because we're so busy looking through our earthly eyes with our earthly mind and looking at these things here. Keep your eyes and your mind above where God sits and not on the world. That's what Scripture says. Why does he say that? Why does he say that? Look up into the hills to which your help comes from. Why does he say that? Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Get rid of every sin, which is another big cause of why the, that junk's in our life. Gossip, complaining, all of that. That's all it leads us to that. Get rid of all that weight that so easily entangles us, those things that's not going to benefit us, so that we can run this race with endurance to get to the end, knowing that we've already obtained the victory. You are not waiting for victory. You've already attained victory. Not through your work, but through his work. You've got everything you need to succeed, and all we're doing is clogging it up by this. We're stopping, and we're not getting. We're praying, and there's no for. Let me go this. We're striving. Mm. Did you know what striving does? This is why that law can never do, produce anything in a man. Striving to fulfill the law, striving to do this, striving to love somebody, striving to produce a fruit. Striving produces false faith. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute. It produces false faith. When God wants to give you real faith to know you've got it now, and you have to keep yourself lined up toward him. That's good, isn't it? We cancel out what God gives us by this and by what this thing starts to think. This is a body that's subject to this stuff. Get it. But this should not be the thing that's going to dictate how you walk, how you believe, how your joy is, what you're doing in life. In order to produce good things for the kingdom, we have to understand where we're sitting. Because he said we are sitting now with him in a position where Jesus is. Far above every power, principality, and might. Isn't that good? He says this for us. He says that he's disarmed the enemy and given us everything we need. This is why we need to pull down the strongholds so that we could take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, ready to punish every disobedience when our obedience is complete. I dare to tell you, honestly, some of us are warring in prayer. Some of us are, are in this place in prayer where we're not seeing victory, so there's no joy, so we really want to quit praying because we're praying for something we already got. We just got to get ourselves lined up to the promises of God. There are yes and amen. Pretty simple. Let me go to this last one, the star. His star. This leads to all men to the kingdom. Somebody say all men. Amen. To the kingdom. Yep, 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 yep. So I want you to go with me to Matthew chapter 2. I'm going to go through this pretty quick. Starting at verse 2. Where is he who was born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. 
When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled on all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests, the scribes, and the people. He inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for it is written by the prophets, You, O Bethlehem of Judea, are by no means the least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. I love that. Then Herod secretly called the Magi, determined from the exact, exact time. I like there's a word reason there, the exact time. Some of us have got to understand the exact time that the star came into our life. The exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go. Somebody say, go. And search for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and to worship him. And after hearing the king, they went their way. And the star which they had seen in the east went on before them until it came and stood over the place from where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced. And they say, there's that joy. Exceedingly with great, with great joy. <laughs> yeah. After coming to the house, they saw the child and his mother, Mary. And they fell to the ground. They worshipped him. They opened up their treasuries and presented to him gifts of gold, kingship, gifts of frankincense that goes on to his deity, the gifts of mirth, which represents his, his burial, which will happen. And we still have to give those gifts to the Lord today. It goes on to talk about who Jesus is. He is the star in Revelation chapter 22, verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things through the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright and morning. Say that again. And then 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19 speaks of the same thing. So we have this prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises where? In your hearts. This refers to the second coming of the kingdom, welcoming his returning, yes, Lord, to where there will be no more tears, fears, no more trials, tribulations, and any such hardships. All darkness will cease to exist because of him. Pretty cool, right? So let's go to Revelation chapter 21. And I want you to see this really, really quick. As these guys come up to play. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illumined it. I like that. And its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there. And somebody had asked me one time, why is the sun and the moon and all the stars going to be gone away? It's because we won't need them. We'll be in the glory of who he is that will be shining through us. That's really good, isn't it? Yeah, I like that. To me, I like it. Its gates will never be closed, unlike some of the gates we're trying to do here. The gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of all the nations into it, and nothing unclean. No one, listen to this, no one who practices abominations and lying, so if you're lying, you best be getting repenting here, shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, but church... All of this we get from here to be able to understand of something that's yet to come. So even the tree, you could go through Scripture, every page of the Bible, and you could find Christ, every page. So why can't we find him in a tree? Because he was represented in a tree before he came to walk around as Jesus that we know who died on the cross. That tree of life is part of that. It's what he represented for us. We see it. See, God sent his angels to give a message of peace being born on this earth. Then God sent his angels again to give another message that victory was attained through the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. 
And now he wants to sing in your hearts again today. He wants to sing to show the world who he is in you and what he can do. Man, it's a great day to be alive. We're in one of the best seasons that we can. So as I close, I'm just going to ask this, which I know all of you here, I know most of you, you all are born again, sanctified, blood-bought, and walking powerful. You ain't got nothing wrong in your life. Mm, it's good. But do you need the tree? Do you need the tree? Can I tell you, we all need the tree. Jesus said, you can't follow me until you pick up your tree, your cross, and follow me. It's pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? So where you're at, let me ask this question. Are you ready for this year? Are you ready to be the light upon the tree, that cross of Christ for the world? To take yourself into a place where all darkness is to show that light. Maybe you've got stuff in yourself that needs to be fixed. You need your bulb changed out so the rest of your string of lights will grow, will just shine brightly. It's on you today. But I don't want you to walk out of here without the chance of being able to say, you know what, Lord, I believe that I need to have my light changed. I believe I'm, I'm out, of, out of order a little bit. I need you to come in just to show me who you are. Once again, sing that song within my heart. So that's what he wants to do, is he wants to sing that song. If the devil takes your song, he's taking your praise. And I think today we need to get that back again.